Mor good morning. Apologize for that slight delay. Paparazzi are always <laughs> following me around. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm in the political science department uh, here at Notre Dame, and it's uh, my pleasure to be chair of uh, this morning's panel, Measuring Poverty and Investing for the Poor. Um, we have an hour and 15 minutes, and I'm going to ask our speakers to stick uh, at 20 minutes or under, and hopefully we'll have uh, time for questions. I'm going to introduce them um, one at a time uh, right before they speak. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Jim Sullivan. Jim's going to be speaking on winning the, winning the war, poverty from the great society uh, to the great recession. Uh, he's an associate professor of economics here at the University of Notre Dame uh, and the co-founder with our second speaker, Bill Evans, of the Lab for Economic uh, Opportunities. Uh, it's a research center that is partnering with Catholic Charities to find uh, research-driven solutions to poverty uh, in the United States. I mean, it is the, sort of the quintessential uh, Notre Dame centers. I'm very pleased uh, that that center was uh, founded in 2012. Very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, Jim Sullivan. So good morning. And <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some research I've been working on uh, for several years now about poverty measurement, uh, particularly a focus on poverty measurement here in the U.S. And I usually introduce this discussion by asking the question, why should we care about poverty? But I feel like I don't really need to cover that in a conference when you all came here to hear about poverty and you understand that it's a critically important issue. Um, but but more, focusing that question down a little bit, uh, really what I, what I need to motivate is why we care about uh, poverty measurement and the official poverty measure in the U.S. and the implications of that measurement, because that's a, most of what my research has focused on. And I should put it in the context of Jim Heckman's talk last night, where he, he emphasized that it's not all about material circumstances, and, and I certainly agree with that. And our goal isn't just to, to increase material circumstances. Uh, there are many other factors that we think are important to this concept we think of as poverty. But having said that, material circumstances are of critical importance, and they are very important indicators of many things that we care about and, and informative for the design, the design of policy. So I am going to be focusing on measuring uh, material circumstances in the U.S. of the most disadvantaged and what's how do we measure that and, and what's, what's happened over time. Um, so why should we care about these measures of material circumstances and their changes over time? Uh, there's a number of reasons to motivate this, particularly focusing on the official poverty rate. It is the single most cited statistic about how well we are doing in terms of the well-being of the poor. How well are our packages of policies doing in terms of successfully helping the disadvantaged? Uh, we, we turn to the official poverty rate as a metric to gauge that. Uh, very often. On top of that, it's an, it's an important metric for the success of the economy. We hear a lot of discussion about growing inequality, and the poverty rate tells us as the, uh, as the pie increases, are those at the bottom, addition, uh, bottom of the in income distribution also enjoying uh, a larger piece of the pie? And the, and the official poverty rate is going to give us an indicator uh, of that. Probably its most direct use is as an evaluation of the impact of anti-poverty programs in the U.S. And uh, we've heard, heard a lot of talk about that recently because we are, we are now in the 50th year, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of the War on Poverty uh, in the U.S. And uh, many have used the official poverty measure as evidence that we have lost the war on poverty. And it really, do, you don't have to search far to find these kinds of examples. Um, you know, <clears throat> on the anniversary of Lyndon Johnson's Declaration of a War on Poverty, there were a number of news articles that came out that declared essentially uh, this fact that we have lost the war on poverty. So what, on what evidence is this based? Well, they turn to the official poverty measure, and they show you number, uh, th it'll show you these kinds of numbers. So this is the official poverty rate over the last 50 years. And what you see is uh, a noticeable decline in the years shortly after the declaration of the war on poverty in the 60s. Um, and it has fluctuated since then, but there has been no noticeable decline since then. This kind of evidence. Uh, has motivated many people to declare that we've lost the war. Uh, as early as the late 1980s, in his last State of the Union address, Ronald Reagan uh, declared, uh, my friends, some years ago, the federal government declared a war on poverty, and poverty won. What, what was he basing that on? Well, if you look at the poverty rate in 1988, it was officially 13%, uh, whereas the, in, when we declared the war, it was, it was uh, uh, 19%, but, but by 1972, it was closer to 11%. So although there were these initial gains, 
Um, since then, it, it had only risen. And how are things gone since, since Reagan's uh, declaration that we lost? Uh, it, things have only gotten worse. So in recent years, in 2012, the official poverty rate was 15%. In 2013, it's, it, it fell a little bit to, to 14.5%. Uh, and so Reagan's not alone here. I said there's many examples. Here's just a report that came out of the Cato Institute uh, that basically ties the uh, lack of decline in the official poverty measure uh, to uh, evidence that, declaring evidence that, this, that our safety net has failed um, so that these policies have been, have, have been uh, unsuccessful. So the, the problem that uh, with Reagan's conclusion and uh, this Cato Institute conclusion and, and many, many others um, is that it's based on faulty evidence and so the conclusion is, is just wrong. And so I'm, I'm going I'm to be uh, very clear on kind of the sources of this because there's been a very rich literature written on the flaws of the poverty measure. And I'm going to narrow down that literature to focus first on, on almost exclusively going to focus on just changes over time. So what is poverty today compared to poverty 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago? Um, we could argue all day about what the, the poverty rate at any given point in time should be. That's, that's separate paper, separate, separate literature. Um, there are many concerns about the way we measure poverty, uh, and, and some of them have absolutely no effect or very little effect on changes over time. I'm going to focus on the two that really do have a tremendous effect on our understanding of how the well-being of the disadvantaged has changed over time uh, in the U.S., and that is um, how we adjust for inflation and, uh, and our measure of resources that go into the poverty measure. So first, the how we adjust for inflation. So the, quickly on how, how we measure poverty in the U.S., there's a threshold that uh, below which you're, you're called poor, and above that threshold you're not poor. And that, that threshold was designated, it varies by family size, but designated in the mid-1960s by Molly Orshansky. And what we essentially, all we've done is update that th those thresholds over time using the, the CPI, so standard, standard price index. Um, that would be fine if the CPI were a good measure of inflation, but uh, the CPI has many flaws in it, and uh, it has been overstating inflation uh, consistently since the 1960s. And this isn't some uh, crazy idea I just came up with. This is something that has been broadly accepted by most government agencies, and in fact, uh, what these government agencies have done over time is fix the CPI. Okay, so why is the CPI biased? A, a quick example um, is there, there are many sources of bias. One is new product bias. So it takes a long time for a new product to be entered into the bundle that we're pricing uh, to measure changes in prices over time. It took 15 years for the cell phone, from the cell phone's introduction uh, until it was introduced into the CPI. And you know, we, we know kind of what happens to, the, to new goods in terms of their prices. They tend to, tend to fall uh, noticeably, particularly uh, soon after they're introduced. Um, so, so that's not captured by the CPI. That's one of many sources, sources of bias. We've rec the government agencies have recognized this. They've changed the way they calculate it, but they don't go back and fix the poverty line correct adjustments. So they, they recognize that it's not correct, but they don't go back and fix it. I've had conversations with the Census Bureau about this. They've added a footnote in their official poverty report, but they can't go back and change poverty because uh, the, the Census doesn't have any say on how you measure poverty officially. It's, a, it's an order of the, uh, of the um, OMB, and, and the Census uh, doesn't have any discretion in terms of changing that. Um, so even though this is broadly recognized, uh, people just still, they still report the official measure, and, and worse than that, they still design policies or, or make suggestions on policy based on this, this flawed measure. Um, these corrections that have been made don't go far enough, and, and so, so the, the results I'm going to show you today kind of take the best evidence about the bias in the CPI and adjust for that. Um, so, so that's the CPI bias. The other one that you've probably heard a lot more about is the bias from resources. Okay? The official poverty compares your income, and it's your cash income. So it's your earnings, uh, the money you get from cash transfers like unemployment insurance and welfare, but not food stamps because food stamps isn't cash. Um, what's important to ask here is what does that miss? Well, it misses the non-cash transfers like the food stamps program, but other non-cash benefits like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, housing subsidies. It also is a pre-tax measure, so it misses the, uh, the, the earned income tax credit and other important tax policy. Now, in 1964, that might not have been that big of a deal because these programs were small. But here's the problem. When we declare a war on poverty, we implemented a number of tools to fight poverty. And those tools are not captured in our official poverty measure. 
And we're using the official poverty measure to determine whether or not the war on poverty was successful. So these are precisely the programs that have been expanded and we're not using them in our measure. So it's clearly not the right metric for trying to measure what's happened, what's happened to poverty. Okay, so I say, I make these complaints. Uh, your, the important response should be, well, does it matter? So I'm gonna just now make these simple corrections and show you what, what happens to our understanding of what's happened to poverty over time. Again, the official poverty measure over the last uh, 50 years, the total change over the last 40, 50 years is, is uh, declined by four percentage points, but again, most of that happened in the, in the second half of the 1960s. What happens if I just correct for the, the price bias in the uh, official poverty measure? If you do that, you see a decline in poverty over the last 50 years of 19 percentage points. This is a very different story. Right? So it's hard to say we lost the war on poverty when, after making just this one simple correction. Uh, but um, we want to think more broadly than that. Uh, and I, so I want to show you what's the effect of expanding resources as well. I don't have the data going back before 1980, so I'm going to pull a Wolf Blitzer and zoom in here on from 1980 to 2012 now. So this is the same figure I just showed you, but I just zoomed in to, from, to 1980 to 2012. And the changes are the official measure increases by two percentage points but the adjusting for uh, the bias is you have see a decline of three percentage points. Now I'm gonna ask what happens if we go after tax and incorporate all these other programs uh, that aren't included in the official measure? And what you see is a further decline, even further decline. Now it's five percentage points. To give you some sense of magnitude, um, one percentage point is gonna translate to about three million people. So this is a difference. Just, just adding the going after tax and adding these benefits is gonna add, is gonna take six million people uh, out of poverty in terms of, in terms of our understanding of what's happened. So, so again, a very different story than, than what you're hearing from, from policymakers and, and the press. Um, now, most of my research has not been on the income side, but has been pushing people to think beyond income to other measures of, of uh, well-being. In particular, uh, I emphasize that we should be focusing on consumption because it's a much better uh, measure of, of well-being. And this is, there's a number of complicated reasons why this is the case, but I think it can be very, made very simple by just introducing you to a few people. The first person I'm going to introduce you to is Joe. Now, Joe is a college student. He's a, a member of a fraternity. He drives a really nice car. Uh, let's say he's, uh, he goes to a large state university in Ann Arbor, I suppose. And <laughs> Joe, uh, Joe's parents have, are paying for his really nice condo off campus, uh, and uh, Joe is having fun in college. These are the Joneses. The Joneses, uh, Mr. Jones had a great career on Wall Street, uh, retired when he was 50. He has a really good account, and most of his interest-bearing income is in off -seas, uh, over, offshore accounts, um, and he lives off of his assets. He spends his assets, and they're doing uh, quite well. And these are the Smiths that are trying to keep up with the Joneses. Mr. Smith, uh, let's say he teaches uh, you know, grammar school at a Catholic, at a Catholic grammar school. Uh, two years ago, he lost his job, but he now has his, he has a job, a new job. Uh, he's making about $28,000 a, a year. Uh, and unfortunately, when he lost his job, his house, his, his roof caved in and they had a big expense. And so he's accumulated an incredible amount of debt. So why do I introduce you to these people? The people on the, the, the Joe and the Joneses, they're officially income poor. They're income poor because their cash income is very low, right? The Joneses are not income poor. At $28,000, even with a family of four, they're above the official poverty line. So, this, so they're not income poor. The, the point here is that income's not capturing what we think of as their material circumstances. But think if you were to look at their consumption. Clearly, Joe's consumption and the Joneses' consumption is high. It's consistent with what we think of as a high, well, or however you want to describe it, but, but, but uh, satisfactory material circumstances, whereas the, the Smiths are the ones that are struggling to get by. Um, so let's turn to a consumption-based measure of well-being and see what happens to, to poverty. Uh, and so here is, again, the income measure that I showed you before. Now I'm just going to go to a consumption-based measure and see what happens to changes in poverty over time when you measure it by consumption. And what you have is an even more dramatic decline in uh, poverty rates, so suggesting improved economic circumstances for those at the bottom of the distribution. I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying that there's no poverty. I'm not saying that, that we don't have to worry about poverty. What I'm saying is that the extent of deprivation is, uh, is less today than it was 30 years ago and 50 years ago, and that's very clear, very clear in the numbers. Let's suppose that you don't believe any of this. 
and you think, oh, you know, you're doing too many things. This is all smoke and mirrors. I don't know if I should believe what price index, income consumption. Okay, let's just turn to observable characteristics that you think might be uh, consistent with what we understand about material circumstances. So let's look at their houses. In 20, look at the bottom of the income distribution. What's the size of the living, uh, living uh, unit that they live in? Um, nearly a half a room larger in 2011 than it was in, in 1981. If you look at uh, whether or not they, that house is, or living unit is air conditioned, much more likely to be air conditioned. They're much more likely to own a car. I could give you statistic after statistic. It suggests that the material circumstances of those at the bottom of the distribution are better off today than they were decades ago. So you don't even need to go to an income or consumption-based uh, measure to, to, to show that. Um, in terms of explaining why, so, so the, 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 we have shown that poverty has fallen, and then the natural question is why has it fallen? And one conjecture is that it's just demographics. That what's happened is that, say, we are, ha we are having fewer children that uh, allows us to, to work more and have higher earnings, whatever it may be. The changes in demographics has led to more education, as a, as a classic example. Uh, that's what's explaining the, the, the decline in poverty. We've done some analysis on this. The blue bars just tell you what the actual change in a decade uh, or a time period were in, in terms of poverty uh, and for, for my consumption-based measure of poverty. And then the other bars tell you what would have happened if, if within a demographic group poverty didn't change at all, but we just let demographics change as they did. The main takeaway of this figure is that demographics is not explaining a large part of the change in of the decline in poverty, with the exception of education which does, the, the, as uh, those at the bottom of the income distribution get more education, we do see that that's having a direct impact on poverty. But that leaves a lot unexplained still. Okay, so so what, what we can do is look at our poverty measures and incorporate these policy changes to see now what role does government policy have? And I'm just gonna focus on a couple of them where there's clear evidence that the policy has an impact. Um, the first is tax policy. Um, the, if you, the blue measure is not incorporating taxes, so it's a pre-tax measure of poverty. The, the reddish is, is a post-tax. And what you see is there's a no, greater decline in poverty post-tax than pre-tax. Most of this, I could go through the different tax programs that, that explain this. Let me focus on the earned income tax credit because there were expansions in the earned income tax credit, which is now, by the way, the largest pro, uh, cash or near cash program that provides resources to the bottom of the distribution at $50 billion. And uh, they expanded that program in the uh, early to mid-1990s, and we see that it has, has had a noticeable impact. If I showed you these numbers for child poverty, you would see it's even, even larger because the earned income tax credit does a really nice job of targeting families with children. Um, the other program I want to emphasize in terms of policies impact is, uh, not, is cash programs. Okay, and particularly I'm talking about Social Security here, uh, but other cash programs are uh, unemployment insurance uh, and the like. And so what you see here is, I, so I take money, income, poverty as the blue, and then if I just take out things like Social Security and I take out uh, unemployment insurance uh, and other kinds of cash programs, what you see is poverty declines much more when you include those programs than when you don't. And this is for everybody, but the main point I want to make here is the impact that the implementation of Social Security program and the expansions of the Social Security program have had on the well-being at the bottom of the distribution. No demographic group has enjoyed greater improvements in well-being uh, than the elderly have in the U.S. And that's very clear because they were the worst off to begin with. In the, in, in the early 1950s, there, uh, you, know, you were getting at, at nearly half, and when you measure it, uh, based on, on um, thresholds, the, the setting pr thresholds the same in 1980, we're looking at, at consumption basis, nearly half of the elderly were considered poor. Um, but we've seen a dramatic decline in poverty rates of the elderly over time, and this is in large part because of the Social Security program. Now, this, I'm not saying anything about the solvency of this program or other concerns that we might have, but it has had this impact that's hard, hard, hard to argue. So let me, let me wrap up so we can uh, give our other speakers a chance to talk. Um, so, in summary, the evidence is pretty clear that we're winning the war on poverty, and the official measure gets it wrong. And the reason it gets it wrong is there are a number of reasons, but really it boils down to two most important ones, which is that it doesn't uh, adjust for inflation appropriately, and it's not capturing the appropriate resources to understand the well-being of, well of the poor. When you look at a consumption-based measure of poverty, you get a different story, and you see greater declines than you would even if you look uh, at an income measure. 
And we can point to certain government programs that have clearly had an impact in declining poverty. Now, I want to I want to leave you with one final comment, which is that I've told you things that have had an impact, but I haven't mentioned that there's a lot unexplained. Poverty has declined for a lot of reasons that I haven't accounted for with demographics or policy changes. And the point that I want to leave there here with, which is which really makes uh, the job of policymakers difficult, is um, that leaves a lot of the change or the decline in poverty uh, to ex economic growth. So we've seen more than a doubling in the real per capita GDP in the US. We know that the pie has gotten larger. Um, some of that, not all of it, has trickled down to the bottom, and maybe not even uh, proportionately. Maybe more of it has gone to the top. But we have seen, with economic growth, uh, improvements in economic circumstances at the bottom. So this leaves us with this trade-off that Jim Heckman talked about last night between between uh, equity and equality, uh, uh, equity and uh, efficiency. And so um, I will stop there. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Bill Evans. Professor Evans uh, received his PhD in economics in 1987, and he came to Notre Dame in 2007. Uh, he joined the faculty as the Kia Hesburgh Pro uh, Professor of Economics. His research covers a broad range of areas, including labor economics, public finance, health economics, and the economics of education. And today, he will be speaking on fighting poverty through research. Uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Evans. Thanks. I uh, met some of you last night. You'll notice I'm dressed differently today. I wore my suit last night. So uh, um, this is a uh, talk about a new research center here at the University of Notre Dame that I have the privilege to uh, start with Jim Sullivan. Um, and uh, it's been an interesting journey for us that really began with a very eventful cup of coffee that we had uh, almost three years ago with Father Larry Snyder and his management team from Catholic Charities USA. Um, Catholic Charities has had a relationship for about a decade up to that point with the university through a program called Mission to Service where the business school gave some strategic planning to local service agencies. Catholic Charities is the largest private provider of services to the poor in the country, touching one in four people in poverty. Uh, and there are 180 local agencies across the country. Um, what Father Larry said at the time was that uh, the delivery of social services has changed very little in the last century. Um, Catholic Charities operate the same today that they did back then. And the basic operation is someone in need comes into a charity and the charity provides a service. Uh, so you might need rental assistance or help with utilities or uh, help trying to find a job and Catholic Charities is there uh, to help you along the way. Um, the problem is, is that uh, really um, Catholic charities are treating the symptoms of poverty and not necessarily the cause. So the cause of your inability to pay this month's rent is you may have lost your job or you may have been unable to get employment uh, or you may have had a gambling problem or a, a, uh, uh, an alcohol issue. Um, and therefore, giving you the rent is not necessarily going to change your overall circumstance. So what Father Larry wanted to do was um, redirect the way social service is organized and have less of a focus on delivering the needs uh, that, the con uh, that the clients have on a day-to-day -day basis and go back and ask the question, why are they in the situation they're in? And is there a way that we can move these people out of poverty? Um, Father Larry then said, given this, uh, how would an economist help us achieve this goal. Um, and Jim and I said, well, here's what an economist would say. An economist would say, in order to move people out of poverty, you have to have programs that work. And in order to have programs that work, you have to do, take the evaluation of the program seriously. You have to know, with hard data and with good methods, uh, is the program actually delivering what it's supposed to? Are you moving people out of poverty? Are they obtaining skills? Are they uh, moving up the, the economic ladder? Um, in order to do this, you have to be serious about the valuation, and that's typically done in an academic parlance through random assignment clinical trials. Uh, that's the way in which we determine whether drugs are effective. That's the way we determine a lot of programs are effective. And so you would have to take the evaluation seriously. 
Um, unfortunately, there's very little evaluation that's done in a social service setting, um, and that's due to limited resources and the fact that it's not their mission. Their mission is to provide service, not necessarily to evaluate what their programs are. So at the end of the lunch, uh, or at the end of the coffee, Father Larry said, well, why don't you guys do this for us? Uh, why don't you come in and evaluate our programs and tell us whether they're working or not? And with that, uh, we started the Lab for Economic Opportunities. Um, the lab is a research center here at the University of Notre Dame, and uh, our goal is finding research-driven poverty solutions. It begins with a unique partnership where at the local level we're working with uh, agencies that are working on a day-to-day -day basis with those most in need um, and they're turning over to us the evaluation of their programs. They have to alter the way in which they're operating uh, in order for us to perform an evaluation, uh, but it's a pretty unique situation for us. Um, the model that we have uh, is that there are a lot of academics that are interested in research on poverty and do programs work. There are a lot of really great ideas at the local level uh, about how to deal with those most in need. Uh, what we're trying to do is kind of fill a missing market and act as a market maker and bring together local agencies and research academics. And so we go and we try to take a look at uh, a particular program. Uh, we have one out in Santa Rosa that's trying to reduce the incidents with which homeless people use medical services uh, out in Santa Rosa. So what we're doing is we're matching up academics who have a specialty in healthcare or the homeless and bringing the best experts in the world to work with these local agencies and devise programs that are evaluative and uh, allow us to figure out exactly what's working. Um, through this matchmaking process, we hope to generate a series of scientific experiments that are generated through random assignment uh, where we can isolate what the impacts of the program are. Under random assignments, essentially a couple people coming in the door, one person is going to go and business as usual, they're going to get their rent check and they're going to leave. In another situation, we're going to enroll someone in a program that's designed to increase their skills uh, to try to help move them out of poverty. Because on average, uh, the treatment of the control groups are going to have the same observed characteristics then we can attribute the underlying success of the program to the intervention because on average everything is going to be the same across the two except for the assignment into the treatment. Um, it's a pretty straightforward measure. It's very difficult uh, for local agencies to sort of buy off of the notion of using lotteries, but the fact of the matter is, is they have to use some device anyway to, mo to uh, triage services because they don't have enough money to serve all the clients that they already have. And so they are using some device already, whether it's need or whether it's timing. Uh, all we're doing is saying, well, let's change the way in which we're doing this and let's just put everyone's name in a hat and pull them out. And some people are going to get more enhanced services than others. Um, we're going to hopefully disseminate these results throughout the network. One nice aspect of working with Catholic Charities is that if we find a program that works in Fort Worth, we can move it to San Antonio, we can move it to Oklahoma City, we can move it to Sacramento uh, because there's 180 local agencies that are engaged in total. Um, see, uh, um, the one question that we have to sort of get buy-in for at the local level is why evaluation is important. Um, and certainly local service agencies haven't had much experience with this. When we talk to them, they say, oh, we're evaluating all the time. Uh, we had a discussion with a homeless shelter here in uh, South Bend. And they said, oh, we go through an evaluation all the time. And we said, well, what do you mean by evaluation? He said, well, we count the number of people that we serve in a given month. And so for them, they're doing better when there's more homeless. Uh, because they're treating more people. So that's not what is meant by evaluation. We have to ask the question, can you deliver the services that are desired? And if your goal is to reduce the number of people in poverty, to increase the skill level of your clients, uh, are your programs actually doing that? Um, from a local agency standpoint, figuring out which programs are working and which ones are is going to help you redirect your resources. Uh, there, we've talked to uh, a lot of local agencies. A number of them are one of the hot topics in uh, 
service at the local level is financial education. It's thought that one reason why people get into trouble is because they don't have a notion of uh, how to deal with their money. They don't have checking and savings accounts. They use too many credit cards. They use too many um, uh, payday lending loans. And if they just had a little bit of knowledge about the problems and the benefits of discounting, and uh, uh, that they wouldn't get into the situation that they are. Uh, about a quarter of all local agencies in the Catholic Charities Network use some sort of financial education. Well, the problem is, is no one knows whether financial education works or not. We had a discussion with uh, Catholic Charities Wilmington. A quarter of their budget is in financial education, and they have no idea whether this is doing any good whatsoever. And so if it's not doing any good, let's rearrange the resources. Let's put them into something that's actually working uh, instead of just doing historically what you've done because you have a grant from United Way. Um, we want to be able to make programs better. Uh, we've done this evaluation of a program in Chicago for their WIC centers. Uh, WIC is a federal program that gives new mothers, uh, pregnant women, and their children coupons to go buy uh, milk and vegetables and baby formula and things like that. Uh, and there's a lot of corruption in the program in the city of Chicago historically over time. And so the state went to uh, Catholic Charity Chicago and said, can you open up stores that are designed solely to give WIC food where no money is changing hands and therefore people can bring in their coupons in a nice safe environment and get the services they need. The stores have been a somewhat a huge success, uh, but one thing we've uncovered is that it, in terms of the coupons that people receive, the redemption rates are really, really low for the people that are most in need. And so if you take a look at families who have less than $5,000 in income, they're redeeming a lot less than families who have income between, say, five dollars and $20,000 a year. And so this gives them an incentive to say, let's focus on those most in need and make sure that they're getting their coupons. It allows you to make your programs better. Um, evaluation is increasingly required by funders. Uh, one of the big improvements in uh, grant making has really been generated by the Gates Foundation and that when they give out grants right now, you have to have money for evaluation. They want to know, is the program you're running actually doing any good? So they're not just giving you money for implementation. You actually have to tell them at the end of the day, did we uh, deliver as promised? Um, the other thing is we want to be able to change the way policy is oriented. And so if we have a successful program, it's going to be a lot easier for us to go to local community colleges or the organization that we're trying to work with and tell them, hey, uh, here's a new policy, here's a new program, here's some hard evidence that's actually working, let's try to expand this over time. Uh, we have a number of projects that are up and running right now uh, or, or in the planning stage. They run anywhere from trying to increase community college persistence to a juvenile diversion program here in South Bend that tries to keep kids out of jail to start and give them a mentoring uh, situation to try to reduce recidivism rates. Um, homeless prevention hotlines, food and nutrition centers, hospital uh, tr transition centers for the homeless. Uh, summer youth uh, employment programs, we're working on a couple local school districts about uh, um, school voucher programs. Uh, we're hoping to get a financial literacy program up and running in the military actually. Uh, but these uh, projects are pretty diverse and with the goal of trying to move people out of uh, the current economic situation they're in. Uh, probably the most gratifying portion about this is the number of partners that we have. A lot of them uh, local Catholic charities, but a number of them are, are other academic organizations and uh, um, uh, other charities that have particular uh, focuses or such as trying to get kids into college or trying to increase high school graduation rates. Um, it's probably easiest to illustrate kind of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis by talking about a couple programs in particular. Uh, three uh, that began with some initial conversations we had with Catholic charities that are now starting to come to fruition. Um, the first one is a program called Stay the Course, which is being performed at a community college in Fort Worth called Tarrant County College, and it's being implemented by uh, one of our uh, frequent and uh, favorite partners, Catholic Charities Fort Worth. If you take a look at community colleges, uh, these are incredibly valuable degrees to have, and the employment rates and wages of people that complete a community college degree are substantially better than those that only graduate high school. Community colleges are a very cheap way to accumulate skills. Unfortunately, community college graduation rates are incredibly low. 
and only, what's the number, 30% of people that started community college um, complete a degree within six years. Uh, at Tarrant County Community College, that number is only 9%. High, or dropout rates of community colleges is really high. If you take a look at the reasons why people drop out, most of the time it has nothing to do with schooling. It has everything to do with their life. Their car breaks down, their mother gets sick, their babysitter uh, leaves. Um, they have events in their life that throw them out of equilibrium and it decreases their ability to actually complete a degree. Um, and so what we've done in the State of the Course program is we've worked with the school, we've taken a bunch of low-income students at the university, and at the beginning of the semester, we select a random group of them and we send them an email. And the email says, you've been selected to participate in this program and you've been given uh, a navigator that you can call. Uh, the navigator is a social worker that they contact with any type of problem that they might have, which is going to threaten whether they're going to be able to stay in school or not. There's a pool of money that the navigators can use to pay for shocks that prevent people from participating in school. So if your car breaks down, you don't have the money to have it fixed, we're going to be able to help you do that. So now if you want glass packs in your car, we're not going to pay for that. But if your you know, uh, uh, timing belt breaks, we're going to be able to get that replaced if that's your only means of transportation. There are one good story we like to tell. There was a woman who wanted to drop out because she got constant headaches every time she went into class. The navigator went to class with her, looked at how she was interacting in the day, and she noticed that she was squinting. So the navigator took her to an eye doctor. She uh, had got a pair of glasses, and her headaches went away, and she was able to stay in school. Uh, for a lot of these kids, their ability uh, to deal with some problems is somewhat limited given their economic and family situations. And what the navigators do is really trying to fill in that gap. The evidence we have through one year is, seems to be very encouraging and that um, persistence rates are up and the uh, credits completed are way up among the people that are involved in the program. And right now we have a long list of schools and local agencies that want to expand this program. The evidence that we have is pretty rock solid because the treatment groups looks identical to the control group. We invited a group to participate in it. And so we're able to support the program now um, in other areas because we have some evidence that the program is actually working. Uh, another program that we're just getting off the ground right now, we hope to have the data relatively soon, is a program on the Summer Youth Employment Program in the City of New York. The City of New York, like most other large cities, runs a very large summer employment program for low-income teenagers. Uh, they employ 30,000 teenagers for an eight-week period in every summer, July and August. They make the minimum wage, they do all kinds of tasks anywhere from being a janitor to picking up at the park to being a, an assistant in a uh, summer youth league. Um, the interesting thing about the program is that there are 135,000 applications every year. Uh, and so to decrease any type of political patronage that might go with the summer jobs, they put everyone's name in a hat and they pull out 30,000 and those are the kids that get the jobs. Um, we have been working with the uh, New York Department of Youth and Community Development uh, to get the list of everyone who has applied for the, um, uh, for the lottery and we've worked with the New York City Police Department um, to get arrest records of uh, teenagers over the time period in which these kids were uh, involved. What we're interested in is whether keeping kids busy during the summer decreases their engagement in, in criminal activity, which is relatively high in this group. This is a particularly uh, a uniquely Notre Dame activity. The only reason we had access to this is because the current Director of Communications for the University used to be the Director of Communications for New York City Police Department. And he put us in the contact with the right people and we were able to uh, uh, get the necessary data to do this. Um, the last program I'll talk about is uh, one where we're doing with Catholic Charities in Chicago uh, about the 311 Homeless Prevention Call Center. So every major city has a central number that you can call to ask for assistance if you're about to be evicted or you're about to become homeless. That call center in the city of Chicago is run by Catholic Charities. The interesting thing about the call center is that it's there to be a triage, uh, serve a triage function. So they collect a bunch of information about the person when they call. 
And then what they have to do is assign you to one of the local service agencies that deals with the homeless or the nearly homeless population. Interestingly, the way the program works is that they collect all the information to figure out are you eligible for services first, and then they determine whether there's a service available for you. The problem is, is that the money available to treat people that are about to be homeless is very cyclic. Sometimes they get resources from utilities or the local government or the state governments, but a lot of times that money runs out within the month. And so you might call on a Tuesday and get an appointment, you might call on a Wednesday and that money is gone. And so when people are calling, we, they don't know whether there's any resources available until they give all their information. Now if you take a look at the characteristics of people that eventually get uh, a, a service and people that don't, they're identical. And so therefore, funding is essentially coming at random. What we've done is we've taken the data from the call center and we've merged it with information from data from the Chicago uh, Alliance to End Homeless, which has the universe of all the uh, homeless shelters in the city. And so if you've gone through a homeless shelter, we have information for you. We've been able to merge up the homeless center data and ask, did this temporary assistance that you receive keep you out of a shelter? And the answer is a resounding yes that it decreases by a large degree the probability that you're going to end up in a shelter by giving you a small amount of assistance in the short term. What we're doing now is we're trying to merge this call center data with data from a research center at the University of Chicago called Chapin Hall, which has food stamp, uh, um, welfare, Chicago public school data, we have the names and addresses and phone numbers of the people that are calling in. We're able to link it to the Chicago uh, public school data. If there's kids in the household, we're going to be able to see, did the family have to move uh, after they made the call? So we're seeing whether not only did you not end up in a shelter, but did you not have to move out of your current residence or not? We're trying to measure the outcomes of the kids. Did the kids perform better in school because they were able to stay in their home? Um, now, the reason why we like this, uh, to talk about this program so much, it's a, an interesting outcome, but it il illustrates kind of the benefit of pairing with a local service, a service agency. Catholic Charities, the uh, Chicago Alliance to End Ho Homeless, do not have the money or the training to go about doing an evaluation. We do. If we were to go and try to collect this information, we wouldn't be able to do it by ourselves. We have to work with a local agency. And so as a result, we're a much more vibrant, much more uh, potentially important program by pairing with a local agency. We're bringing something to the table, the expertise to do this. They have all the administrative information that is necessary to do the evaluation. And so we think it's a pretty useful partnership. Uh, see, there's a lot of undergraduates in the audience. If you go onto the Notre Dame webpage, uh, we do have uh, calls for in, uh, employment prospects, not only for undergraduates, but for graduating seniors as well. At the beginning of this, we had no money, and so we were hoping to staff it with postdocs, but we staffed it with undergraduates. After doing this for two years, we realized, well, we don't need the postdocs. The undergraduates have been pretty good. Uh, so we, we had five last summer. Uh, undergraduates, we're probably going to have 10 this summer. We're going to hopefully have in total four uh, new undergraduates working for us during the summer. So there's those job ads that are on the Notre Dame webpage if you're interested in taking a look at I think they're linked from our LEO webpage as well. Uh, let me just say one last thing about LEO. Um, everybody sort of deals uh, and, and in their own way fights poverty. I mean, you volunteer at shelters or you contribute money to your favorite charity. Um, it's been a blessing for us to be able to integrate our research into this, uh, into this goal. Um, and so the, the most gratifying component for us has been working with these local agencies um, who deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, just being able to see their enthusiasm for their work and to put some numbers onto it is a bit of benefit for them. And the good thing for us is that they've been able to put a human face on this fight for us. And so overall, it's been a very rewarding experience for us, not only academically at all, but also personally as well. And we're very proud to have this at uh, Notre Dame as a Catholic institution. So thanks. Thank you, Bill.
Uh, <clears throat> our last speaker this morning is uh, Professor Martin Kremers. Uh, Professor Kremers uh, joined the faculty in 2012. Uh, we stole him away from Yale University. He uh, teaches courses on fixed income markets and corporate governance. His research focuses on empirical issues and investments and corporate governance as well. Uh, Martin's a good friend, and it's a pleasure to welcome him to the stage. He's going to be speaking on impact investing for the poor in light of Catholic social teaching. Yes, thank you. My privilege to, uh, to join you this, this morning. I'm a finance professor teaching in a business school, um, and I'm definitely not an expert in poverty, like most of the speakers at this conference. So what I'm doing here, um, I see it as a challenge. Um, generally in finance, we don't think much about poverty. It almost seems like it's a different world. And um, it's a bit, a, a bit of a puzzle. I mean, it's just not something that we, that we think much about. It also reminds me of the joke. You know, you know, do you know the joke about the guy attending a, co a conference on poverty? Oh. So the guy attending the conference on poverty, he meets a Franciscan and a Jesuit, and he asks them, Fathers, is it okay if I say a rosary so that God will give me a Mercedes-Benz? And then both priests look puzzled, and the Franciscan asks him, what is a Mercedes-Benz? And the Jesuit, who's not our pope, asks him, what's a rosary? <laughs> So I see the theme of the conference very much as, as a challenge, as a challenge to particularly finance. And I recently um, learned about impact investing. I think impact investing is a very interesting new phenomenon that I think is very, gives a useful framework to think about how finance or business in general can help uh, reducing poverty. So I want to start with talking about what impact investing is, how it integrates things that we already know about, so kind of terms that we already are familiar with. Now, what is different in impact investing versus those other things like social enterprise, corporate social, corporate social responsibility, and social investing? Give some examples of impact investing. Talk about advantages and challenges, and then related to how more generally um, the framework of impact investing can challenge our thinking about finance and business um, in general. So let me start with what is impact investing. So it has three aspects. And as you will see, this, this idea of everything is a triad, or if the theologians will give me permission, a trinity, with a small t, obviously. Um, that, is, that is a recurring theme in my, in my presentation. So I use it more as a pedagogical framework when I teach. And most of my courses I teach at Notre Dame are finance or business in light of Catholic social teachings. So impact investing is investing in businesses that create value through fulfilling social needs, particularly for the poor. And you actually measure, as a business, you measure the impact on everyone involved with the business, in particular the impact the business has on the poor. And you do so in a market environment. And that includes more than making profit, but it definitely includes making a profit. So the social impact then is an inherent part of the business strategy. It's not something on the side. It's not something we, we, we talk about around the water cooler on Friday afternoon or we put in our annual report, but it doesn't really affect our day-to-day -day business. It's inherent in the strategy of the firm, the mission of the firm, the vision of why does this firm exist? Well, we exist to fulfill certain social needs. By fulfilling those, we create value. We create value for everyone involved with the firm. And that means we need data. We need to evaluate, we need to judge. That means we need data not just on investors, and that's what we're good at in finance, by figuring out are investors doing OK, but we also need data on everyone else involved with the, with the business, including employees, customers, um, and, and the poor more generally. And then in the market environment, that, that means there are certain discipline that comes from working in a market environment. Working in an environment where you have significant competition, where people have different choices, 
Um, so you have a certain accountability towards the market, including towards investors. There's a certain transparency. You need, to, you need to convince your investors in the first place that you're actually providing value, that you're fulfilling social needs. Right? That's where the data part comes in, and that's where your investors invest in your business because they're interested in more than just the financial bottom line. This is in a, what is also called a triple bottom line. Uh, and you're also accountable towards that. And the market can help with efficiency. You need to get results. You need to get results to get profits. You need to get results to get everyone to cooperate with the business. And you also need results uh, to attract investors, <coughs> particularly if they are social impact investors who very explicitly want to link their investments with social outcomes. So social um, impact investing then is related to three other practices. So we have social enterprise, we have corporate social responsibility, and, and social investing. And impact investing can be thought of as combining these three. So the social enterprise has a social impact. <coughs> the corporate social responsibility is generally thinking about more a stakeholder view, what happens to all of these people, and we want to make sure that, that we don't harm anyone and that we actually treat them uh, in, in the right way. And social investing is about investing in a way that, that is subjected to the market discipline. Um, at the same time, there's a difference between impact investing and these three things as well. Impact investing, in my mind at least, and this is a term that is still being uh, defined as we speak, um, but impact investing really requires this full triad, or again, with permission of the, from the theologians, a full trinity with a small t. So, Social enterprise is not impact investing if you don't really have data on social outcomes. Or if you don't, if the firm is not really subject to market discipline. So the firm would allow very below market expected rate of returns or even no profitability at all. Or if the funders don't really care uh, what happens to the outcomes. Corpus for sociability is not impact investing if corporate sociability is not a very inherent part of the corporate strategy. Or if it's not what managers are held accountable for. Yes, we put it in our annual report, and we may even have a special report on sustainability of corporate social responsibility, but at the end of the day, when we decide how much to pay people, which managers to promote, which not to promote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we don't really care. Okay. Social investing. Um, it's not impact investing if it only uses negative screens. And that's most of the market for, co corp uh, for social or ethical investing. Almost everything that I've looked at at these funds, they have negative screens. Okay, social impact investing is very much about fulfilling needs of the poor, so proactively positive screens, if you like. Or if social investing is, again, willing to accept much below market returns. <coughs> um, Two examples, um, there's many, many different firms that I could have chosen. I chose two um, that I think are, are simple to explain. So many poor, in, in this is, a, this is a picture from Africa, many of the poor have really, really basic needs having to do with energy and light. And so most of the poor in, in Africa at the moment, they, they use kerosene as their main energy source. That's dirty and dangerous. And it's actually a very poor light source. And then this company came up with solar lights that are very cheap and strong, and they can sell to these people. And it's been very successful. They, they've sold uh, tens of millions of, of these lamps. Um, and this is the product. Okay? You can buy it on Amazon for, last time I checked uh, this earlier this week, it's 1701 okay? uh, without tax. And you can buy it on the Amazon equivalent in India, uh, Flipkart is another online seller. I, it, that, in, that seller website was $10.52 uh, if, I, if I use the um, exchange rate uh, from, from India. And maybe cheaper if you buy this in a local store, I don't know. A second example <coughs> is a social impact bond. They're also called a pay for success bond or a social benefit bond. So this is how it works. You have private investors who loan money to some project manager. The project manager um, would manage the project, but 
lets the actual, it, it's not actually the person who, who actually does it. So you have the Peterborough Prison Social Impact Bond in the UK, which, which started a couple of years ago. That's really the first one. Uh, you also have the Rik Rikers Island Social Impact Bond in the United States. You now have tens of, not hundreds, but tens of these uh, around the world. The crucial thing is that the repayment that investors get is dependent on the social outcome. So investors only get money if the poor benefit. That's the idea, at least. So therefore, we need to actually measure how well this is going. So here's some basic example from this particular social impact bond, when we write this island social impact bond. The more we keep people who were in prison out of prison in the future, um, the higher the payments from the city. So the city will have to pay more money if the program is more successful. But of course, the idea is that, yes, you have to pay more if there's fewer people who go back to prison, but they save a lot more because they don't have to pay uh, for, for the prisons, plus they don't have to pay for all the other social outcomes that are associated with people getting into prison. And then investors do very well if the program is successful, and they don't get anything if the program is unsuccessful. So if the, if the poor, if you like, don't benefit, the investors do not benefit. Um, Chicago is starting uh, its social impact bonds as we speak. Uh, Goldman and JP Morgan, they have special entities that try to sell these things. Then the broker, project manager, they, they, they fund the service provider, okay. which could potentially be Catholic Charities as well. I think Catholic Charities is looking at these things to see to what extent they can actually become involved uh, in this as well. And then you have independent evaluators, and maybe Leo can play a role here. <laughs> if successful, the government will pay the project manager, and the project manager will pay the uh, investors. Okay. And here are some examples of the UK, different examples of social impact bonds here uh, worldwide. And the idea is that everyone benefits. Okay. So, so what, are, what are advantages of social impact, uh, social impact investing? Well, People who are poor also have great element needs, they lack relationship with participation, they need access to new services, new products, and, and new skills. Um, well, business can, is good about fulfilling needs, right? and then make a profit in the process. If you make a profit, that would be sustainable. They lack relationship with participation, well, business requires committed cooperation. Uh, a business only benefits if everyone involved with the business is benefiting and committed. And by employing poor, that builds relationship and builds participation. The market discipline can help as business competition can encourage improvement. It encourages innovation, being different right, from your competitor. It also reduces dependency of the poor. If competition works well, right, then the poor have, have, have more choices. And it can lead to less dependence of the poor on government, on nonprofits, and monopolies. But at the same time, you need all three. Right? Um, there are also many challenges. Um, and I listed some of them here. Um, the business re requiring money, well, in many crisis situations, the poor simply don't have anything. Businesses need to work in a certain environment, where, so the businesses themselves have great dependence on, on, on institutions. Business, to be efficient, requires large scale and standardization. Often when you're dealing with the poor, the, the, the solution is more local and more particular. The, the lack of relationship with participation, well, what if people don't have a certain skills? And how, how, what can a business do about that? Right? So you have to have businesses who employ people and through their employment build, build up skills. And that's a big challenge. It's not typically how businesses think. Businesses, when they hire people, they think, what can you do for me? rather than the full potential of the human person. Let's start them in a minimum wage job and then build them up over time. That's how very few businesses, I believe, are thinking. How, how am I doing in time? Thank you. So impact investing in light of Catholic social teaching, let me um, summarize Catholic social teaching uh, extremely briefly. 
When I think about Catholic social teaching, it means human flourishing and the common good for the glory of God. And then the common good is this triad of human dignity or human flourishing in solidarity uh, in the setting of subsidiarity, where we think about integral human development in, um, where human freedom plays a central role and the development of our virtues plays a central role. If that's the purpose, then a priority would be establishing just corporate relationships of solidarity also with the poor. And in business practice, it would mean entrepreneurship in subsidiarity. <coughs> subsidiarity has this aspect of human freedom, but the subsidium is Latin for help, involves actually actively helping the poor to actually participate in the business, becoming entrepreneurs themselves, hiring them, and through their work, uh, help them uh, with in their development of skills and virtue. So impact investing can has to have the right purpose if the social impact actually advances human dignity. The problem is that impact investing is a very neutral term. Impact is a very neutral term. Many people may mean very different things by having a right impact. Many people in poverty reduction, I believe, think that abortion is a wonderful thing. And so what is, social, what is the right social impact? Is it actually based on Christian anthropology or what it mean, what, on human dignity? Now, just core relationship of solidarity, yes, if the benefits and risks are shared proportionally. As in my example of a social impact bond, the investors only benefit if the poor benefit as well. Can we do that also in a, in a for-profit business like DLA? Um, then in the practice, yes, if serving, uh, if the business actually serves this integral human development in solidarity with the poor. As a finance, uh, <coughs> professor, most of what we do in finance is studying the market. And then what I think is, is an overly reductionist approach to finance and business is to apply market-based thinking, we, we understand markets reasonably well, to apply that insight to a firm. But a firm and a market are very different things, I believe. Yes, they are related, but you cannot apply market-based thinking to the firm and stop there. So, but, so let me, for the moment, just think about markets and, and, and then uh, relate that to impact investing. So what do markets need to function well? Well, markets are about information production and sharing, about doing transactions with some form of accountability, and having competition with open participation. If you have any of these three things not available, then markets to some extent don't function very well, or are not efficient, or are very costly, or are liquid. Uh, and that is very large literature in, in economics that talk about this. Um, in the interest of time, let me, let me skip most of that. So do markets then help the poor? Well, let's go through those three requirements that economic theory and, and, and empirics have clearly shown are the three requirements for markets that function well. Well, do they function well for the poor? So information production sharing, transaction with accountability, competition with open participation. So yes, market, the markets will work for the poor if the poor have equal or cheap, easy access uh, to the market. Uh, one story uh, I really like is this idea that the poor in Africa, who could not rely on, on good transportation or communication, they benefit a lot from cell phones. With cell phones, they could all of a sudden call people cheaply and figure out you know, what is the price of this good in the next village, or this guy's offering me this, now what did you get? Right? And so all of a sudden, they've got much, much better information about what the market is. Know if the insiders control the information. Transaction accountability, yes. If market participants are held equally accountable, no, of course, if you know, connections and wealth determine how the market treats you, whether or not there's any accountability. Competition with open participation, yes, if we actually have choice and equal access to some extent to, uh, to compete. No, if that's collusion and privileged access, so this crony capitalism. A lot of regulations <laughs> make it very hard. Oh, I apologize. Um, they make it very hard for the poor to, to compete. I think I'm out of time. Um, so let me conclude. I wanted to talk also about common justice and distributive justice also in light of the early session this morning. Um, so let me conclude. Can I conclude in one? Thank you. So impact investing is again investing in businesses that create value through fulfilling social needs, where you measure impact on everyone involved with the business, 
in a market environment. My main thought is that this should apply to every business and to every investor, not just investors that particularly think of themselves as impact investors or not just a social enterprise. I think this basic framework is a, very, is a nice framework in my mind to think about uh, how every business should think about, uh, think about the business. And then the social impact would be subject to common good justice or justice that actually contributes to human flourishing. These relationships the firm has with everyone involved where we care about the outcomes, that is subject to distributive justice. Is this justice corresponding or proportional to the actual human needs, to the actual commitment that, that the company has to different people and to the actual contribution of different people towards the business? And finally, this market environment is subject to cumulative justice or justice in exchange. Thank you. Let me call our uh, speakers to the, to the table here. And uh, we just have a few minutes. Uh, we'll privilege uh, undergraduates with questions. Let me just start with a comment, though. That was a phenomenal example of what a Catholic research university does. So thank you to all three of you. Um, any undergraduates uh, with a question? Please, stand up. Uh, tell us who you are. My name is Leah. I'm from the University of St. Thomas. And um, I have a question um, for Evans. Uh, so you said, well, I'm just wondering, what would you say to someone who says that putting these social services under a really tough hold of evaluation could, or it could be seen, seen as more of a political move? Um, so what's your take, or what would be your defense to that? Obviously, everyone wants efficiency, but if a SNAP or a WIC program is under evaluation and it's seemingly really critical, how would you treat that? <coughs> so uh, a lot of agencies don't like evaluation. And so uh, we've had a number of discussions with some and they've decided to pass on it uh, because they're happy with what they're doing. Um, the, the problem in fighting poverty is that money is in short supply. Um, and uh, funders, whether they're governments or foundations or private donors, are uh, increasingly asking, are I getting, am I getting uh, the returns from my investments? Um, and so although there, um, some might find it invasive and other charities might find it uh, to be an intrusion on the way in which they operate, uh, we think we can do it without sort of interrupting their daily business um, and provide them kind of some necessary information that's going to allow them to go forward. Uh, and so in our state of course program, we've had some reasonable early success. And right now what we're trying to do is parlay that into tripling the number of people that we're actually serving. Uh, not only at the Tarrant County uh, campus, but also moving into other college campuses as well. Um, that money wouldn't be available to us, and our assistance wouldn't be available unless we had the information that actually the program worked. Um, we were working with one unnamed agency, and the person we were talking to said evaluation is a virus that takes over your program. Uh, and so we don't think we'll be working with them in the future, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, in, in many respects, it's going to become necessary in the future, uh, just as money is tight uh, and programs are uh, need resources, those programs that can demonstrate success are the ones that are going to get them. Uh, and we think that the more forward-looking directors are the ones that we've been working with so far are able to uh, sort of buy into that model. Uh, and. We hope we're not too intrusive into their process, but it's, it's at the same time, uh, you know, the, we think that the partnership has worked pretty well in the cases where we've been able to start the programs from scratch. If I can just add to that. First, you should ask Father Larry Snyder because he's going to, to UST soon, so you can yeah, ask him yeah, directly. But, yeah. but this idea of evidence being used for political means, um, I think it. It, this enters into this idea that you can you can use evidence to say whatever you want, and so you could just people will just skew the research to show that it works or skew that it doesn't to support a political agenda. And what I would argue is that there's nothing less political than rigorous scientific evidence. So it's just what the evidence <coughs> is. So you want to push is something that's concrete and, and completely apolitical. 
and a rigorous evaluation will tell us the truth as opposed to something that supports a political agenda. Hey, one other question, perhaps uh, by someone who's got their PhD in the last 24 hours. So, Ryan, <laughs> Anderson. Uh, so, Phillips of my dissertation committee, I uh, defended yesterday. My uh, dissertation was on social justice in the political science department. And I work at a think tank in DC right now on uh, issues related to poverty. And I was wondering, uh, my question is mainly for the first panelist, but also then uh, for the second. The measure that uh, you presented was largely in terms of materials, uh, an economic measure. And I think all of your correctives are, are right. We don't just want to look at income. We look uh, account for inflation and also account for transfer payments and various uh, and poverty. Um, but what about some other measures of poverty? Uh, we've seen that the out of wedlock childbirth rate has exploded since money was the third quarter. So 50 years ago, births of single mothers in the US are single digits in the African American. 25%. That's what sets Moynihan throughout the report. Today, it's 40% of all Americans, 50% of Hispanics, and over 70% of African Americans. Uh, I think that's a measure of poverty, the lack of intact family, in and of itself. And I think it probably also perpetuates the cycle of some of the material. Uh, uh, same thing, as I understand it, that the male workforce participation rate is the lowest that it's ever been. Um, and so if you think of kind of an effective anti poverty program, it wouldn't just be. Uh, how much stuff do you have, whether it's income or transfer payments or ability to consume, but actually kind of returning to self-sufficiency, human flourishing, based upon the dignity of work and uh, the dignity of the family. Um, so I guess the one question is how could we be measuring poverty better to encapsulate that? And then the second kind of panelist, how can we effectively uh, respond to some of that? Because what I appreciated that some of the Catholic charities programs that you mentioned were focusing on work, focusing on education, focusing Family. But some of the ways we structure our federal welfare programs actually provide uh, perverse incentives. Um, you actually can get more money by not being married, by not working. Um, and they try to, you know, with work requirements, they try to uh, implement fixes. Um, the work requirements were attached to uh, uh, only one of the 80 federal we tested uh, welfare programs. So and I guess thoughts on what can be done at the policy level to not uh, detail some of the uh, dead incentives. I get the easy part of that question. <laughs> I'll tell you what the problem, how to measure the problem with the how to fix it. Uh, so um, I couldn't agree more on what, what is sometimes called a multi-dimensional measure of poverty. Um, and it ties very closely with what Jim Heckman was saying last night in terms of thinking about capabilities. Um, and it's very important to emphasize that no one feature and, and not even material circumstances are going to be a good measure or a complete measure of poverty. Um, it might, and it, you might even argue that in a place like the US, it's even less important because we're not talking about abject starvation in the US, where then maybe really all we should care about, first order, let's worry about material circumstances. But we're not in that situation in the US, and so we need to be thinking more broadly. And so I couldn't agree with you more. In terms of what to do, um, is it, let me just say there's one uh, qualifier here in terms of, of moving towards multidimensional measures. And that is that um, the attraction of a poverty measure like the official poverty measure is it, it encapsulates a lot of information into one measure. And people just say, what happened to the poverty rate? And you could just get lost in these debates, but yeah, well, you know, out of child, uh, or out of wedlock childbirth has grown, but you know, on the, at the same time you see employment for women growing, and you just need to go back and forth on all, all of these different measures. Um, what I would think would be a nice compromise would be to encourage the federal statistical agencies to move to report um, a larger set of measures that address exactly what you're talking about. So it's a multi-dimensional poverty measure. Don't necessarily index it into one measure, but allow people to get uh, to have easy information to or easy access to information that gives you a much more holistic perspective. Um, this is something that Great Britain has actually um, moved much further down the line in, in uh, implementing, and I think going forward is something that you're going to see. <coughs> Uh, so in general, I, I kind of agree with you in terms of social programs, the, in terms of the incentives. I think um, I think the incentives, though, are a lot more uh, <coughs> multi-dimensional um, than, uh, than you think. So ju let's just take the, the health care reform right now. If you're low income, you get heavily subsidized health insurance under the ACA, which is good for the people that don't have access because uh, they work for small companies. 
but the problem is, is that right now uh, you get subsidized health care, you get subsidized food stamps, you get uh, earned income tax credit, you might get, uh, um, uh, you might be on uh, welfare as well. Um, so the marginal tax on you for earning just slightly a little bit more is going to be pretty high. You're going to be sacrificing subsidies on health insurance, on your food, maybe on your housing. Um, and so I, I think that those incentives are real uh, for a lot of different programs. Um, in, in terms of how we're trying to deal with that, uh, a, a lot of what we're trying to do, Heckman talked about last night in his talk, um, the programs that we're focusing on at the individual level are really about skill acquisition and skills on, the, on a lot of different dimensions. It could be just measured by a community college degree. The one thing that we've sort of, um, or at least I've come to believe in our conversations with uh, the, uh, the social service organizations is that one skill that you have to instill in people is that they can change their life. Um, and so we're doing a survey, we're going live with a survey in, uh, in, uh, in February or March, or with a, with a program in, in, in Fort Worth. And we have to have a baseline survey. And it was adamant to the people that ran the program that we need measure of do you believe you can change your life and do you have hope? Because if you don't have any hope, you're not going to invest. And the only way that you're going to prove is if you invest. And so the first thing we need to do is change the way that you think about yourself and the control that you have over your life. Um, now, that's a very difficult thing for an economist to talk about because we don't have really good measures of hope. I mean, if we're doing a crappy job of measuring poverty, man, imagine the job we're going to do of measuring hope. Um, but I think it's really important that you do change these skills. They might be soft skills, but uh, if you have no notion that you can change your situation, you're not going to invest. And the only way that you're going to prove is if you do. And so that has to happen first. Um, and so I, th this is a very difficult problem in terms of moving people out of the situation that they are. And so it has to take many different uh, aspects. The other thing that we're, that if we're trying to test this in what we're doing is that um, uh, there's two things that we keep hearing. The first is that um, the problem-solving skills of people in bad situations is very limited. And so they need the assistance of case workers, case managers, social workers, to help them get out of the situation that they are in. Um, now, there's many different reasons for this. Bad schools, uh, bad family situations, they just don't teach problem-solving. Um, but they need the assistance. The other thing that's a, that, that uh, is clear in the discussions that we've had is that little things can have very large impacts. And so uh, you, a bad event prevents you from completing your degree or forces you to make a decision that's in the, your short-term interest. So you go out and get a payday loan, then you can't pay it back, you become more in debt, and everything just snowballs out of control. Um, and so what you have to find are these pressure points in the system where people are making critical decisions and help them out at that time. Now there are key points in your life, like when you're in school, keep the kids in school. When you're in high school, make sure that they don't drop out. Make sure that they uh, don't get in, in, in uh, relationships that uh, are going to be damaging. And so. Uh, those are very difficult things to, uh, to manage. Um, but the, the agencies that we've talked to have some pretty clever programs to, to help along those dimensions. And, uh, and so I, I, acquiring skills is, is the most important thing. Uh, what those skills are can be very, very diverse. Uh, and so the, the, there's a, a, a very, multi-dimensional problem and one that's going to take uh, a lot of different <coughs> programs to sort of narrow down and figure out things that work. Uh, but it's been fascinating discussion. It's been eye-opening for us um, just because, you know, for us, people are just lines of the data set. You know, we have a bunch of descriptive information for them, that's typically, but now there's much more human 
contact, you know, we're getting to know who some of these people are and their stories. Um, so it, it definitely changes you, not only personally, but the way what you think about problems. And uh, so I, it's, it's been a, a very educational experience for us. I saw a few other hands up. Uh, I apologize, we are actually past time. I'm gonna ask our speakers to stay here uh, at the front of the room and invite those who might have uh, further questions to come up and talk to the speakers directly. Professor Kramer has uh, generously brought copies of his slides. They are also available up here in the front. I encourage you to go to the LEO website and uh, also please uh, join me in thanking our three excellent